34 years, seven months, five days, and three hours. Since I was born, that's so sweet. This is not an interactive session. 34 years, seven months, five days, three hours. Since I walked into a room of people like me and my life was changed forever. 34 years, seven months, five days, three hours. Since I raised my arms, they sang, I cried, and we laughed, and life was changed forever. So much joy, so much pain, so many singers, so many songs, thousands by this point. But recently one has stuck with me over the last few months. It's this one. We live on borrowed time. No one can be sure when the loan will finally come due. My Gala loan, the countdown is on. Four months, three weeks, two days, July the 13th. That very long loan, 35 years, is coming due. The truth is, I haven't just borrowed time. I've borrowed everything I have, as, as have you all. You in this room and others who are no longer in this room have loaned me everything. You've loaned me music. You've loaned me ideas. You've loaned me a shoulder to cry on and an ear to listen to. Everything I have has been loaned. Some of you have actually loaned me your choirs from time to time, and I'm grateful. I have borrowed a bunch of gala choruses in 35 years, either for a workshop or an interim, or just to go see and watch what you do with them. At the time this song came along, I had just zero converted. And it was in the midst of our AIDS pandemic. And so the borrowed time, we live on borrowed time, and the loan coming due was quite a different message for me. And yes, I'm one of those people that has survivor's guilt. We borrow our clothes, we borrow our food, we borrow our children. We borrow this land on which we stand. Oh, wait. No, we stole the land that we stand on. It's not borrowed. And I'm grateful to Gala Choruses for the encouragement and the idea of land acknowledgement that all of us are now doing. It's interesting that we're doing a land, we all, we're doing land acknowledgement all the time. And um, one of our singers wrote this week and said, could we add at the end, um, and we pray for a time when we can return all of this land to the ancestors. And I pass it by the leadership team and they're like, yes, that would be awesome. But it's a dream. It's a dream really that we uber liberals hold. And not, most of our audience is uber liberal where we are, but probably not where you all live. Standing here to summarize 35 years and this movement is impossible. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever done is uh, what to say to you. I don't know if you remember that when Edith Bunker went to her 40th high school reunion and someone came up to her and said, Edith, what have you been doing for these 40 years? And Edith says, well, the next morning I had waffles and just want you to know, I'm not going to describe every meal that I've had for the last 35 years, I promise. I've been trying to figure out if I were seated where you are and some of the other dinosaurs who have moved have gone on before me, if Dennis Coleman had been standing here to describe his more than 35 years, what would I want to take away? It's really, really hard. Ever since Jane said, do you want to do a session? And I was like, yes, I do. But I'm going to take this back uh, a long way. Y'all take a little trip with me. We started our lives with music. We started our lives in a womb, listening to a steady blood flow of shh and a steady heartbeat, thudum, thudum, 
for them. And some and some of our mothers may have played Mozart, you know, with a cassette. Well, actually, when I was born, there were no cassettes. Wow, <laughs> I have no idea what they did. A phonograph on a thirty-three, and then all of a sudden, that beautiful quiet that we can only imagine as gala conductors, it all changed. <laughs> Shocking. But what happened when we made that sound was all around the room were laughs and smiles and tears. And we realized that what? Actions have consequences. It was the last time we were going to make that noise and get smiles and laughter and tears. <laughs> so I have 10 gala director tips in my presentation. The first one is, actions have consequences. But my tip to you and my, my request is that you look at the actions and the consequences as good. They're all good. In the moment, they may not feel that way, but they are all good. And don't borrow trouble from the future. We borrowed some trouble on Friday at the very opening session of an yeah, sorry, John, I think it was you. Like, do you think we'll still be getting vaccinations in September? And I'm like, Jesus Christ, we don't know what we're doing next week with, with COVID. That is borrowing trouble from the future. It's nice to ponder, but I think we need to worry about, you know, two weeks from now, not, not vaccinations in September. Did your parents, um, now go back with me another time. Did your parents have you perform for friends and family when you were this big? How, right by you, raise your hand. Yeah. Most of us, when friends and family would come over that, and we had just learned the ABC song or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or something like, oh, you know, sing for the people. And if we were little, they put us on the piano bench and had us sing. And, and we danced and we laughed and we played and we sang songs, never quietly. Did you ever sing piano? <laughs> no, that's not, it's not a dynamic that kids know. It was loud and it was big and we, oh, it was just the joy of, uh, you remember that, how much fun it was? And then unfortunately, somebody said, shh, your father's sleeping. Shh, you're too loud. Maybe you sing out of tune. Maybe your gestures need to be smaller. Don't be so flamboyant. Some of those things came into our being don't be so loud. And so what happened with that, all of a sudden, interesting that it was the same people that put you up on the piano bench now telling you, shh, don't be that, that person we, we uh, taught you to be. And so immediately, even though you didn't really know it, you began assessing the risk and counting the cost of singing out loud. To sing is to risk being off key. I'm going to sing in a minute again. And Paul, being the God that he is, said before he releases the video, he'll auto-tune it. <laughs> so I'm so grateful for that. To dance is risk to risk missing a step. How many of you have teach your choruses, choreography? Yeah, well, there you go. To bang is to risk being told to be quiet. One of the first things we do is bang on our high chair trays in restaurants loudly. And the parents never seem to notice the child that's banging. You know why? Because they were there for the rehearsals. <laughs> so, to laugh is to risk being a fool. Gala tip AD, AD tip number two, take risks. Take risks with your choir. Because you know what? We've created a safe space to allow the singers to risk being themselves and to laugh and to sing a wrong note and to miss a choreogra choreography step. You can risk, and you can risk, of course, with your audience, which we'll talk about that. When you were little and growing up, people ask all the time, 
What do you want to be when you grow up? What do, you, what do you think you want to be when you grow up? How many of you, by show of hands, said a gala chorus conductor? <laughs> what? what? No? But we had dreams, didn't we, about what we would do? And they weren't always exactly what we thought. sing there's no money in that i want to dance real men don't dance i want to be pretty pretty is as pretty does i want to paint Fine, but stay within the lines the boxes that were being put around me every day became smaller and smaller I want to be like G.I. Joe or Bernadette Peters in a Broadway show. I want to be like Neil Armstrong and stand on the moon while I'm singing a song about Barbie and hiking trips. I want a hot dog with potato chips. Someday I'll be the king of the world and I won't take a bath. Yes, you will. Or clean up my room. Yes, you will. Or take out the trash. No allowance for you. And I'll sleep until noon. Don't you use that tone with me. These are the things that I like. From dressing up nice to riding my bike. I want to see. Fine, but stay within the line. I want to dance. Sure, but stay I within the I want to see. Stay within the lines. I want to sing. I went to Donald's session yesterday on the aging voice. And I decided at that session not to sing today <laughs> because he gave all these things of like, you know, what the aging voice sounds like. And I was just like, check, check, check. I do not want to be your example of the things that go wrong with a 71 year old voice when you've stayed up drinking way too many nights in a row at gala choruses. <laughs> that was the first 35 years of my life. And for for most of you in this room, you can count the years that you lived someone else's story. It wasn't yours to tell because it wasn't authentic. You know this story. I look around this and all of you all know this story, so I won't, I won't go into it. I won't belabor it. But for the three people in here who haven't heard it, um, in 1986, I came out. I was the Associate Minister of Music of the First Baptist Church of Houston and on the faculty of Houston Baptist University. And I came from a whole line of Baptist, professional Baptist people. And I came out and people say, how'd that go for you? <laughs> so you all know that uh, I lost everything and um, found myself you know, in a Motel 6 with all my worldly possessions in a Chevy Blazer that wasn't taken by the bank. And um, just thought, well, what am, what am I going to do now? I, I was starting over, I thought. I, hadn't, I didn't have any gay friends I, I, in 86. I, just did, I, I knew there was one hairdresser at the First Baptist that we thought, <laughs> but he wasn't a friend because I'd been too afraid to associate with somebody that people thought might be gay. And I heard, strangely enough, that there was such a thing as a gay chorus. I'm like, what? I thought the First Baptist Choir was pretty gay. Um, and there, it was in Dallas, Texas. And I heard through the grapevine that they had advertised their full-time artistic director job at 35000 a year in 1987. This is now 87. I was like, I can pay child support for my two kids. When I came out, they were seven and nine. I can pay child support with that. So I applied for the job. The week of the audition, the president of the chorus, Michael Sullivan, took me to lunch. He was the head of the search committee. And um, he said, we had um, lovely lunch at the Black Eyed Pea, and I felt right at home. And he said, well, there's been a change. Um, the salary that was 35000 well, we've had to adjust that just a little. It's 12000 
Yeah. And I thought, well, I can't pay child support on that. So what would I do? So I'm taking you back. Do you remember the first time you jumped off of a high dive? Go back there with me. Um, it looked like Mount Everest. I mean, you're looking at that, you see people going up and you're like, hmm, which one should I start with? <laughs> it had something to do with cousins or friends calling you chicken or sissy and badgering you until finally you decided, I'm gonna go up there and I'm gonna go up there and I, you climb up on the ladder and then you're like, yeah, no. And you turn around and there are people on the ladder below you and you can't get back down. So you ooch, you ooch all the way down to the edge and you to the end and you think, I'm going to die. I will die from this. And you think if I scoot way, way down, <laughs> it takes a couple feet away and I might just be paralyzed. And, um, and then all of a sudden this happens and you jump. Every single child or adult that does this comes out of the water and goes, I want to do that again. <laughs> Gala tip number three. You can't die from jumping off a high dive. What is the high dive that you have been so afraid of taking a leap? What's the leap in your life that you're afraid of now? So I my high dive in 1987 was Jesus. I'm supposed to audition for a choir that they just chopped the salary from 35 to 12. What would I do to pay the child support that I've already told you about? I decided, oh, you know, what the hell? I got nothing. I got nothing. I'll just go audition. And I described for you in the very beginning the life-changing moment that, what, that that was. And it didn't matter if they weren't paying for real because it was so uh, transformational for me in my life. That choir was called the Turtle Creek Corral. They were dysfunctional, codependent, bankrupt. It was a match made in heaven. It's like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is so perfect. We're the perfect couple. And I've been in the same, same kind of relationships later. Um, <laughs> so I started. And I realized that the drama of the Southern Baptists was nothing compared to the gays. <laughs> oh my gosh, there were many times when I thought, I'm just gonna go back in the closet and into the womb of the Southern Baptists because at least they have Jesus. <laughs> I wanted out. I just like, but like, what are you gonna do now? No, there was no going back. So I began auditioning for jobs about six months into that first year. And um, I, auditioned, applied for the head of choral studies at a university and went and did all the things. And <clears throat> the kids loved me. I gave a recital, it was great. The faculty loved me. It was a shoe in. I went home and was packing my bags when the dean called and said, um, hi, and I'm like, this is it. This is the, my, my ticket out of this mess. And he said, well, you didn't get the job. I'm like, I clutched my pearls. I was like, what? What? And he said, well, here's the deal. You're a racehorse. And you talk to the dreams and tours and growing the choral program. And even like you mentioned Carnegie Hall, it was just, it was beautiful. But we're not looking for a racehorse. At this point, we're just looking for a milk cow to come every day and just feed the children their milk. It was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. It was such a moment. AD tip number four, find your inner racehorse. No one is paying you to be a milk cow and just show up. And where it, where it uh, demonstrates itself most is in our activism. 
You can't be a milk cow and go along with the status quo and just go, this is, I'm just showing up. No, uh, we are called, we are called, whether you think so or not, to be racehorses and push the envelope and create and be exciting and run around the track and then run around it again and run around again. And it doesn't even matter if we win the race, we're called to be racehorses. So I stayed another year because I didn't get that job and became a Kelly girl. How many of you know what a Kelly girl is? Uh, that's the totally, totally just cut the age bracket <laughs> right across the middle. <laughs> Kelly girl is a temp. And I just made sure that they called me Dr. Kelly girl because um, I was a Kelly girl with a, with a PhD. That was ridiculous. Um, and I stayed with the Turtle Creek Corral another year and then 18 more after that because I just couldn't get enough. My first rehearsal, it didn't happen in the audition, but my first rehearsal, I think there were 37 people there. That has been verified by the historians because we make up numbers. Uh, did did y'all know that? <laughs> we ADs make up numbers. Like, I have 400 people singing in my choir. <laughs> We rehearse in a room that seats 280, but there are 400 <laughs> somehow. We stack them and we're like, geez, really people? Uh, I can count in your picture that you don't have 400. And I have done that in the past, <laughs> counted singers of other choirs. And uh, how many of you have done it? <laughs> Liars. And <laughs> I walked in and second tenor sitting right there covered with sores, just sores. So you got to know I'm going to cry, right? I had no idea. I thought that's the strangest thing I've ever seen. At the First Baptist, if your hair isn't right, you don't go to rehearsal, really. At break, I asked John Thomas, who became my best friend and mentor, what what's with Jeff? What is that? I had no idea. And he said, that's KS. And he's covered with um, KS lesions. And I said, why is he at rehearsal? And John said, because rehearsal is keeping him alive. The second time, gala choruses changed my life. And I thought, you know, I, I should know this. I've known this about music. I didn't know it about, about gala and gay choruses and, and AIDS. I didn't know that. But I did know that music changes our lives. <laughs> And in years to come, 
Your tears will come from deep inside. And when the pain is more than you can bear, remember. to sing. The music reached its mark and did its magic. Remember to sing. That's what was happening for Jeff. We remembered that even in his shape and the way he was, we remembered how many times in your careers has that happened for you? Countless. AD tip number five. Remember to sing. Dennis Coleman, our sage um, conductor of Seattle Men's Chorus for longer than 35, uh, used to counsel us at leadership conferences when people would come and just go, oh my gosh, my board is doing this and all that and blah, blah. We have, we have a whole session still. <laughs> Dennis would literally say, I, I can tell you, I'll tell you who it was because it was Michael Hayden at the Indianapolis Gay Men's Chorus or Indianapolis Men's Chorus that was just, but then, of course, that's Michael Hayden. But um, <laughs> he said, do your singers love you? And Michael went, oh, they do. And he was like, the rest doesn't matter. Wow. And I remembered that. I have remembered that because I've had a few uh, tussles <laughs> with boards in my life. And I've remembered do the singers love you? Do they love making music with you? It's really a, a really important thing to remember. As soon as I arrived in Dallas, this older uh, member, Ed Young, took me to coffee. And um, I think this is great. And he said, there's this thing called gala choruses. And I'm like, oh, what's that? And it's gay and lesbian choruses. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. And they're going to have this festival, and it's just awesome. And I was like, well, we should go. It's in Seattle in two years. And he said, well, there's a problem. And I said, what's the problem? And he goes, we're not members. And I'm like, well, we should be members. The chorus was seven years old. And he said, well, I'll pay the registration fee, and I'll even pay the application fee or whatever it was for the festival. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. Only to find out, of course, that the board had made decisions over seven years that they were not going to be members of GALA because it was just too gay. Well, we'd already paid our registration, and I had already told the chorus we were going. So, um, <laughs> Pack your bags, girls. We're going. And so, yeah, that didn't work out so well. Um, but Ed also said, um, and while, while we're at it, I'll pay the entry fee for us to march in the gay pride parade. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that'd be so. I have never done that in my life. That's great. And he did. And the board had decided we're not going to march in the gay pride parade. So, years, and Sean can attest to this, for years, People left. I mean, people left the chorus because that's not who they had been or thought they should be, was an openly gay chorus. And um, for years, those people out there who had left were like, that Tim Seelig, he came up here and he dragged the Turtle Creek Growl out of the closet. To which I'd say, you're welcome. <laughs> I actually said to, at a board meeting when they said, this is not, not who we think we are, I said, hi, well, then you have the wrong artistic director because I did not go through what I just went through coming out to go back in the closet for you. It's just not going to happen. And, you know, here we are many, many years later. What is it about our personality profile that 99 people can say, 
That was fabulous. I loved the concert. It was so great. And one says, hmm. That's all they have to say, actually. They don't have to give me, like, <laughs> I had a partner once. Uh, you should never ask a spouse on the, or a spousal unit or a date, whatever, in the car on the way home, how'd you like the concert? No, no, no. You may as well say, do I look fat in these jeans? I mean, same kind of question. I had a partner once. Some of you all knew my very first partner, Lewis, and everything to him was pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So I was like hyped in the car. How'd you like the concert? It's pretty good. Well, I got rid of him. (laughs) Oh, no, no. Literally, I said to him, if you can't learn a fucking superlative, (laughs) we're done. And he didn't, and we were done. (laughs) AD tip number five. Oh, boy. You can't make everybody happy. And you shouldn't try. I love the parable in the Bible about, which is like completely wrong about Jesus and the flock of sheep, flock of sheep. And there were 90 and nine. There's songs about the 90 and nine, but one had wandered off onto the craggy, uh, whatever cliff. And Jesus left the 99 sheep who had said the concert's great and went over here to the stupid sheep that had wandered off and said, "Mm." (laughs) he's like, but I'm providing for my flock over here. And he's like, Mm. Um, Why do we do that? I mean, Jesus says to do it. She was wrong. (laughs) It's it's not what we should be doing in gala choruses for sure. We attended gala chorus in Seattle. We surprised the folks by coming out in blue jeans, boots, bolo ties, looking and our tux coats. It was quite something. And that was fine. And we sang fine and, you know, people were nice. But I was sitting in the audience. And the Seattle, the San Diego men's chorus came out to sing. And halfway through their set, they invited the San Diego women's chorus to join them. And I wept again. And I came home and I got a lesbian friend of mine. And I said, let's go for margaritas. And she said, okay, let's start a women's chorus. And she said, okay. And so the next week we had four people with margaritas. And the next week it was eight, literally. <clears throat> it just kept growing. And finally there were 25 people in a planning committee and we got all the plans done and all of that. I was so excited. And about eight weeks into the planning, it was time really to start. And they're like, thanks for your help. Bye. (laughs) I assumed I was going to be the first conductor of the chorus I had founded. (laughs) And they said, no, no, we have identified a woman and we think that's a better fit. And I was like, more a woman than this. But... (laughs) (laughs) So they started the women's chorus, and uh, after a year, the, that the woman that they hired didn't work out. She was she had issues. She was straight in a marriage, and then she fell in love with one of the production coordinator in the women's chorus. It was just a mess. So she left, and they came back and said, "Would you be our conductor?" And so for the next. Off and on for the next 12 to 15 years, I was their conductor. And I just have to say that, um, yes, Ann Albritton was my accompanist and arranger and pianist for 17 years. And um, the executive director of the Women's Chorus of Dallas was Eve Campbell. So how could we go wrong? I mean, it was just spectacular. Um, Joining the Gala Network, I just thought, was not going to be like a Baptist church in the denomination. I thought everybody was going to get along, and it was going to be so awesome. And I just ran headlong into the buzzsaw of, you don't have G in your name. Really? We were doing really great things, and making a mark for the Turtle Creek Corral, and singing at national ACDAs and all that, but... mm, not good enough because you didn't have the junior name. Uh, chief among those was New York City Gay Men's Chorus. A long story it was awesome, and um, but the other chief in just bashing the Turtle Creek Corral was wait for it, the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, <laughs> and what that's called is karma. <laughs> Uh, 
in 1990, uh, 1990, you know, we used to do a lot more swapping out. I don't know if travel was cheaper then, but we did more uh, inviting choruses to come and do that than we do now, far by far. Uh, we just don't do that a lot. So we invited the Seattle Men's Chorus, the other big chorus without the G word, um, to come to Dallas and sing with the Turtle Creek Chorale. And I wanted uh, something uh, that we could both sing together, a song. And my assistant uh, conductor, Chris Anthony, said, I'll write something. And I'm like, okay. And he'd arranged a few things. And he wrote this song for the Turtle Creek Crowd and the Seattle Men's Chorus to sing together called I Shall Miss Loving You. And they sang the Agnus Day from the balcony, and we sang the I Shall Miss Loving You from down here. Chris said, um, he made the mistake of saying, well, this is actually a, a piece in a larger work that I have in mind, in my mind, based on the stages of grief. And I'm like, oh my gosh, well, that'd be great. I'm going to put it in the season brochure for the fall. Seriously, because um, I wanted to like make sure he wrote all of this because it was really beautiful. In August, we came together and he passed out when we no longer touch all the movements with the stages of grief. And um, we sang in October the world premiere and there was a whole row of people from PBS and they said, we have to make this into a documentary. There was some hesitance on Chris's part because unbeknownst to us, he had full-blown AIDS and it had not exhibited physically, so we had no idea. And he was a church musician, and while they knew he was gay, he was not really prepared to tell them that he was also dying. And um, he decided to do that. And so for the next 18 months, PBS filmed our journey and filmed me at Chris's bedside, and many of you have seen it. And it resulted in After Goodbye, an AIDS story, a documentary that the night PBS showed it nationally, 20 million people watched it. And um, it went on to change so many people's lives and when the, won the National Emmy in 1994 for Best Documentary. Two days before we filmed, LA and San Diego came to Dallas on their way to the Denver. And two days before we filmed it at the Meyerson Symphony Hall, Chris died. And uh, Peter McWilliams, the Texas by Peter McWilliams. And in the documentary, you can still find it online, Elizabeth Kubler Roth talks about her stages of grief in that it's really spectacular. And one of the things I, I'm most proud of, because it still exists um, in hospices and AIDS wards for people to watch. Um, it was kind of crazy. Uh, Jeff threw me into the role of AIDS activist the minute I saw him. And I, uh, it was much later when I zero converted myself, but um, we worked really hard as did all of your choruses who were around in the late uh, 80s and, and into the 90s. We did a lot of stuff. Gala festivals, oh my gosh. Uh, one that stands out was Tampa when we were all in the arena and Maya Angelou stood up and said, I am black, I am white, I am straight, I am gay, I am one. I mean, it was just electric. And it, it gave us this sense of, wow, somebody like Maya Angelou is, is giving us props and allowing us to be whoever we were. We, of course, did a European tour because that's what we did. And um, we made the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest choral concert in history. Uh, just over 20 hours we sang. And that was uh, interesting. And um, I carried the Olympic torch in 1996 as an AIDS activist and community hero, and I have not run since. Just <laughs> needed to know that. But we, we were in the fight, as all of you all were. We were in the middle of the fight. We had no choice to do what we did and, and sing. And San Francisco was an epicenter for all of that. Tip number seven is share your hopes and dreams with your chorus. They love you. You're standing up in front of them. Tell them what it is that you're hoping and dreaming about. There's a good chance some of them may fund your dreams and hopes. But if they don't know what you're thinking about in a year or two. So in 1988, I said, 
We'd been going a year, and I said, we should make a Christmas cassette. That would be so awesome, because we're sounding good after a year, and we should do this. And I went to the board, and I said, we can make a 1,000 cassettes for $3,000, and we can sell them for $10 and make $10,000. And they're like, we don't have $3,000. So, no. But I had shared it with the, the singers, and then you go back to the singers and go, I'm sorry, we're not going to get to make the cassette. And Scott Davidson um, wrote me a check for $3,000. And so um, we made the cassette. It was just precious. And back in those days, you didn't have to pay royalties or rights. So we sold them and made $7,000. And at the first board meeting after the first of the year, I went to the board meeting, and they're like, so where's the 7000 profit we made? And I said, well, I'm sorry, but Scott Davidson wrote in an agreement when he gave us the three that the profit would be invested in the next recording. They were not happy. They're like, can you just go back in your closet? And I said, no. So that funded from the heart the first CD that the Turtle Creek Corral made. And it was a big hit. It was really fantastic. And the profit from that surprise went into the next recording. So people have asked often over your 20 years, how did you make over 30 professional CD? That's because in the very beginning, we invested in recording and it just kept, we made money and we we're like, well, shit, we'll just make another CD. I mean, that wasn't the only motivation. Uh, my ego was a lot of it, but. <laughs> Commissioning has been the same way. Uh, it's unbelievable uh, the way my chorus and other people have supported the commissioning of new music over these last now 11 years. It's remarkable. We have, um, yeah, we've just, the singers want to help. And, and people also in the periphery. It doesn't always make the development folks happy when you raise money for a specific thing. But most of these people are not going to give $10,000 to the general fund. They're just not. They want their name on something. I want to underwrite the orchestra for I'm Harvey Milk or whatever it is. So share your dreams. In 2000, the first woman in the women's chorus had died of breast cancer. And Nancy Brinker of the Komen Foundation came and said, I want to, I want to commission you to write a big choral symphony on the story of, of breast cancer survivors and their families. And I was like, fantastic, thinking it's Komen Foundation. And she said, but the problem is we have no money. Like, well, yes, you do. I know you do. But all their money goes to research. That's it. That's all they fund. So we began writing. I got 10 composers to say they would write on spec. Pamela Martin Stewart wrote the texts, and we started out, we rented the symphony hall, we got going to have an orchestra, we had no money. So I went to a company that had uh, Gary Rifkin sent me to, and we went to the president and their leadership team, and I told this story, and we played them groundless ground. Many of you all know Groundless Ground, but like, this is one, like a little demo, and the, we need $60,000. And the CEO, after it was finished, walked up, shook my hand, and goes, son, I don't think I've ever met anybody on more Groundless Ground than you are standing right now. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. And you said, and we'll give you the 60000 It was unbelievable. And that's all from sharing dreams. There's no ask. There's no, like, begging. It, there's just never been any begging. The women's chorus and, and the Turtle Creek Corral singing together was amazing. The Sing for the Cure was a moment when we were able to put our AIDS walk and journey in perspective as the women began their journey with, with um, breast cancer. So at that concert, um, we stopped the very beginning, and the men and the women were all mixed, and we changed our pens from red to red and pink. It was a moment forever where we, we shared um, the love. The, um, <laughs> Pamela Martin and the, the Coleman Foundation said, we need a narrator. And I'm like, yeah. And they said, would you like Maya Angelou? I'm like, no. no. I said, yeah, why don't we do that? Um, 
The only other uh, world premiere that is one of my favorite stories is the Women's Chorus and the Turtle Creek Chorale and the SMU Symphony Orchestra, 80 pieces, uh, premiered The Awakening. Joseph Martin, we did the world premiere of SATB, The Awakening. And it's recorded, sadly, um, for me, because when we got in there with the, the world's most beautiful acoustics, and I had an 80-piece orchestra and over 300 singers, and we're singing The Awakening, Joseph's six-minute piece lasts nine because I'm like, I'm not hurrying. I don't know if I'm going to get to do this ever again. I'm going to drag that shit out. Um, after that, Joseph um, literally coined a musical term, seligardo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he has actually written it in a couple of our commissions that we've commissioned him for, seligardo. And the translation that he says, it's kind of uh, Italian-German because of my name, um, means... Milk it for all it's worth. <laughs> and that has been the story of my musical career. I don't know. I look back and I go, what? Why did you take that so slow? I don't know. I wasn't old then, so I can't know for sure what happened. I started therapy when I was 18 years old and haven't stopped yet. And um, I love therapy. I mean, I have, I pay someone to listen to my stories. It's great. And, um, but I was in therapy in that, in year number 18, year number 19, and I was exhausted. My soul was empty, but I kept saying to the therapist, but this is who I am. The Turtle Creek Corral is who I am. And she would say, no, it's what you do. I was like, no, you don't under, you, no, you just really don't understand. I'm getting a new therapist who, you know, will uh, verify my idiocy. And I was like, no, 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 it's who I am. She finally said, she just kept saying, Tim. And I was like, I have no idea. What, what would I do? I mean, seriously, this is who I am. And finally, I one day realized, no, this is what I do, not who I am. And I literally drove from there <clears throat> to the board chair's office and resigned and said, I'm going to give you a year. It was the end of 19 and I'm going to, I'll stay a year while you all search, but I, I have to go. And because I was just so worn out and you all understand that. And I never looked back on that decision. And in that year, people were like, what do you need? Well, we want you to stay. We'll give you more money. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going. And I did. And it was another high dive moment because it's terrible. A divorce is terrible when you're leaving just because you want to leave, not because there's something else out there or someone else. So it was really, really tough. But when I stepped down, I was the luckiest man on the earth because there was this thing called gala choruses. And in their strategic plan had been an artistic director in residence, but they just never done it. And Robin called and said, we have this one year appointment as artistic director in residence. You can apply. And I did. And multiple people applied that year. And I was I was so lucky in that time that I got the job and I actually stayed two years of what was supposed to be a one-year term. And then I handed that off to Jane Ramsire Miller, who has kept it for 10, <laughs> her one-year appointment. <laughs> yeah, she's hanging in and aren't we grateful? I certainly am. I did a bunch of other things during that time. And um, I wrote some books and did some conducting and was still teaching at SMU, so life was full, and I was the artistic director. And in those, in those two years, I got to either visit or consult with 40 gala choruses. I got to know you all and your choruses really well. But then I was done with the gays. I was done. I was approaching 60 years old, and I was done. I had waved my arms at gays for so long. Up there, were, My arms were exhausted. I was just done. And then this job came open in um, San Francisco, and I thought, you know, that is not the job in San Francisco. How far back was that? Oh my <laughs> gosh. Oh, it was far back. <laughs> I missed a slide. What will people think? This is a, a tip number six. No, number seven. What will people think? 
it's important that you that you imagine what people will think, but it's also not important what people will think because you have to step out, step out on groundless ground. Okay, now I can go back to my real story about San Francisco. It was a job that, um, you know, was, it was interesting. I'll just let it play. Once upon a time in a strange faraway place where sometimes the people were even stranger, <laughs> there was a boy, a sensitive boy, and he grew and grew and grew and grew until one day he decided he needed a bigger place, a better place. So he headed west to a bigger and even stranger place where he knew he would feel at home because the boy knew that even though the ranch was bigger and the chores were different, it was a lot like where he grew up, a place where men are men. And sometimes, so are the women. It's just a little bitty pissant country place. Nothing much to see, says he. No drinking allowed. We get a nice, quiet crowd. As plain as it can be, it's just a piddly squatting old time country place. Nothing too high tone, just lots of goodwill and maybe one small thrill and nothing dirty going on. So you can find that on YouTube, and it's a spoof on the entire little whorehouse from Texas, uh, all over San Francisco, and a lot of fun. Well, it was crazy. And my third week there, um, John Stewart, John Stewart, um, just called the office and said, um, San Francisco has just been named the 11th gayest city in the country by the advocate. And Minneapolis has been named the first gayest city. Uh, we're looking for someone to speak on air on John Stewart's show, uh, supporting San Francisco as the gayest place on earth. And Teddy Witherington, our executive director, said, oh, well, this is perfect. We have a, a new artistic director. He'd be happy to speak on behalf of San Francisco <laughs> that I had only visited on occasion. <laughs> so there's a, the, one of the only uh, GLBT museums that exists is in San Francisco. And one of our singers was a docent, Tom Birch. And I called him and I said, I, I know nothing. You've got to let get me in the museum and give me a crash course on entire four-hour crash course. It was the best thing I could have ever done. So if you ever take a job, just do a crash course in your, in the city and where you're coming from. I learned everything from how gay the gold miners were in the mid-1800s because there were, you know, thousands of men and just a couple of brothels. What were they supposed to do? And then there was World War II and Rosie the Riveter and all. It just, I learned the whole thing. So the day came uh, when Jason Jones was the stringer and we had the interview. It was hilarious. I wish I could tell you more, but um, in those things, you know, you sit like this close and there's a camera on me and a camera on him. And I said, I'm not going to be one of those people that when you ask me a question, I go, I'm just not. Well, of course I was. It took like that long. And the producer also said, and by the way, you're not supposed to be the funny one. You're not supposed to make any jokes. That's his job. And I'm like, okay, I have to go now. So <laughs> it was hilarious. And it's, you can also find it archived. But he didn't ask me any questions about San Francisco. And then he went to Mr. S. Leather. And he went down through the Castro where, you know, the Manny Petty place is called Handjob. And, I mean, so he's showing all this stuff. And then he goes to Minneapolis. And he's meeting with a, a little adorable couple in their home. And he said, what do you all do for fun? And they go, we play board games. And he goes, but what do you, like, when you get out? Where do you go? And literally the next scene is the two of them pushing a cart in Target. <laughs> it's, it's, 
it's the best. So you, you must go find uh, archived The Gayest City. Um, at my very first board meeting with the, the uh, San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, we had a, a consultant, Lena Bernstein, and we're all sitting around and she said, okay, board, here are the three things you do. The board had done everything. Literally, I was there and there was a big kerfluffle because there was not water backstage. And I asked, who's in charge of water backstage? And they're like, they looked at me like, oh, the board? <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh. The board did everything. So Lena stands up and says, okay, hi, this is what you're supposed to do. Three, three, three things. Set strategy, protect the fiscal responsibility of the organization, and, and hire Executive staff, not all the staff, just executive staff. You don't mess with anything else. Okay, that's great. Now I'm going to give you post-it notes, and I want you to write, as a board member, your dreams for the next part of the future. Because she actually told them, she actually said, you've hired Tim Seelig, and I don't think you can handle it. So that was lovely. And I'm like, Thanks, Lena. So she walks up to the first post-it. She pulls it off the wall. She turns over here and goes sing an Elton John concert, ripped it up, not your job, and dropped it on the floor. Okay. Oh, yes, she did. She goes, which one of those three did that? Next one was take a tour to Europe, you know, buy an airplane. I mean, it was just like ridiculous. None of them fit. It was brilliant. And thus began... My arrival was, okay, we had done some things at Turtle Creek that really worked. So who's the, the chorus leadership? We don't have chorus leadership. It's the board, because most of them were singers, if not all, at that point. And I said, well, okay, that's not really going to work. And so Dallas, um, Herb Kellerer had, um, had adopted, and it's just sitting there forever, uh, had adopted the servant leadership model for Southwest Airlines, meaning that he had done everything long before the whatever, who's your boss, whatever that, you know, whatever that show was. And so we had, it was way upside down because the board was at the top of this pyramid with a couple of executives and doing everything and trying to run everything. And so this is the servant leadership model. And we had, um, the most important thing we have are friends and families and fans and patrons and donors. That's the most important thing. Everything that, in, that involves us is listening to those people and serving those people. It's not the other way around. So we had this, um, we had this singers, the green one. We had that. We had plenty of singers. They were doing nothing. The board of directors was doing everything. And so the first thing I said was, well, <clears throat> who's your leadership team? And they said, well, we don't have one of those. And I said, well, we're going to have one of those. And Teddy, the executive director, this was early on, said, you couldn't possibly. It will take two years to pass a leadership team through the policies and procedure committee. And I was like, no, I'm going to have a leadership team in August when we start back. And he said, no, you can't. And I said, well, watch. Get your popcorn. Sit right there. And um, I had a leadership team by August, which my then partner said, that's great. Why don't you just call next season excellence through extortion? Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, if it works. What happened was we began with a leadership team and people started realizing that they could have a stake in what was going on, that they could also be a part. And it wasn't just the board. We didn't go to them and go, we need help. It was an exciting time. We started a leadership team, the member engagement team that I mentioned on Friday, that all they do is survey the members over and over every single concert. They're surveyed and they love being able to tell me what they think about the concerts. We started the uh, Forte, which is the social club. We started Hot Mess Tickets, which is a drag team that sells tickets. We even have the Easy Bake Coven, and that's a bake sale that they raise money for our scholarship fund, and it just kept going. And at this point, we have 285 singers active, and easily 150 of those serve in a volunteer capacity in addition to singing. And they love every minute of it. 
it's it is um so we got the the green we got the singer worker bees in there which just changed everything one of the things that you have to learn is um board language how many of you all have had myers-briggs you've done myers-briggs you should do it you know one of them is bottom up or top down thinking we are top down thinkers we have these big grandiose ideas and the board most of them are bottom up thinkers so i go to my board and I go, oh my gosh, next season is going to be so great. You're going to love it so much. I have a vision. Next season is going to be butterflies. It's going to be awesome. I don't know any songs about butterflies. Les Papillons is the only one that I know. <laughs> butterflies. It's going to be so great. And I have a vision. We're going to take it on tour. And at the end, at the big climax, we're going to release butterflies into the hall. <laughs> and the board's listening. And they say... How much are butterflies? <laughs> Who's going to sweep up the dead ones? Because this is what they're worried about, is what happens at the end. So I should have remembered that I need to speak their language. And I should have come in and said, we're going to do this great concert next year, and um, we're going to have props. And I've got, already got somebody to underwrite the props. And they're like, that's good. And I've already talked to the venue. And for 50 bucks, um, we have somebody that can help clean up the props, those props, you know, after we're done. They're like, that's great. And here's the budget. And they're like, great, do that. And on my way out, I go, it's butterflies. Because <laughs> they really didn't give a shit what the prop was or just needed to know who was going to sweep up. Tip number eight, learn the language of your board. Learn how they think. I never, and never is a big word, but I never go to the board with an idea or a dream that I can't fund never would go to the board and say, I need an orchestra for X, or I want to commission X without having a, a way to fund it. And it makes things really happy. Um, when I got to San Francisco, well, when I was a tourist, I used to visit the National AIDS Memorial Grove. And, um, but that was, it's amazing, at, the, at Golden Gate Park. And when I got there, I started looking for the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus etched somewhere, and it wasn't there. And I said, what, wh what? We've lost almost 300 singers to AIDS. We are the epicenter of AIDS along with New York. Wh what? And the answer was, well, we've just always gotten busy and we didn't have the funding and it just, it just kept getting kicked down the road, as you all know. And I said, oh, no, 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 again, I didn't go through what I've just gone through in the AIDS pandemic, not to have the chorus name. So we were thinking about, there's a, there are boulders. You must visit, by the way. There are boulders that have etched. And I was like, okay, a boulder's 15,000. Or there's a bench. But it just didn't, I didn't think that, that it was right to have the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus on a bench where people were going to sit on. It was just didn't feel good. So um, throughout my life, I, Hawaii, since 1975, has been my a place. And there's a Buddhist temple on the north shore of Oahu that has this huge pagoda and a gong. And when you walk up, it says, say a name, and the, gong the gong, and the name will go out into the universe and live forever through that sound. And I was like, I want a gong. So I go to the National Age Memorial, and I was like, I want a gong. And they're like, no, this is Parks and Recs. It's run by the, the government. You're never going to get through because... It's a quiet, but blah, 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 blah. And I, I, my response to that was to go shop for gongs. And um, for real, I just wanted to be ready when it happened. Finally, I just kept saying, no, no, the, I feel like this is the right thing. So I guess three years ago, they called and said, bring your staff over. We want to show you something. And I said, okay. So they took us through the grove and up past this beautiful little brook to the top that it's just stunning and oak trees. And they said, we've decided that you can have this plot of land because it's not in the grove itself. It's up from the grove and you can have your gong. And I said, well, that's swell. And they said, and it'll be $125,000.
And that's when my work husband, Chris Verdugo, and I, if you wonder what the hell's been going on for six years, how did we get where we are? It's because Chris is a yes man, and I'm a yes man, and it's always, sure, let's figure it out. Never has Chris said no. No, we no, we can't do, just let's figure it out. So I'm happy to say that um, there's an artist portal. And many of your chorus's names are etched there. We'll On a clear that. October night in 1978, 100 men gathered at Everett Middle School with the hopes and dreams of starting a chorus. I was there. Two names emerged as possibilities, Men About Town and the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. The second would be a huge risk. You could be fired from most jobs for being gay. Choosing the latter, we emerged as the first openly gay chorus in the world. And three years later, we embarked on an extraordinary nine city tour. On the day we departed, the San Francisco Chronicle heralded the venture. A smaller article on the same page described a mysterious pneumonia found in five homosexuals. That mysterious pneumonia soon had a name, AIDS. It became the headline and changed our lives forever. The deaths mounted and came in never ceasing waves. The chorus became more than a chorus. It was family. We were there to hold and nurture each other, to serenade and to mourn. We even often wondered if there would even be a chorus when this horrific scourge was over, if it ever ended. The first list of those lost was in our 1988 10th anniversary concert program. There were 38 names. In 1993, we took a photo that demonstrated the number of chorus members lost almost as many as there were singing men. Those with their backs turned represent the number of chorus members who had passed. In 2018, we reenacted that photo when the number of deaths reached almost 300. That list and those photos provide just the smallest view of the unimaginable horrors to come. They were just a hint at the massive loss of life that would reach over 32 million worldwide. As I said, most of your choruses names are etched there and gay bands and one Baptist church, <laughs> First Baptist Greenville, South Carolina. AD tip number nine, live your mission. Judge every decision you make based on your mission. And if your mission statement is not good, change it. But live on that. My programming goal for today was the same programming goal that I have for every concert. You all know it. You've heard it way too often. <clears throat> and that is not tender, loving care, but a tear, a laugh, and a chill bump. And I wanted us to have a moment in my programming every single time. This morning, I thought, okay, is there going to be a tear and a laugh and a chill bump? And I don't know. I was hoping for... Um, a much colder room so that we would have the chill bumps. But we've always added uh, a in our programming, along with TLC, a oh no you didn't moment. 
uh, our audience expects an oh no you didn't. This was fruitcake. You all remember it from Gala Festival when we had Donald Trump. And it's probably the uh, when we're singing about fruits and nuts and fruits and nuts, it's probably the biggest ovation we've ever had was the Donald Trump. But this year um, in our lovely holiday show, which has nothing to do with holiday, but we celebrate current events. And this year we celebrated Britney Spears <laughs> being free. And the audience just goes nuts. It has nothing to do with what we're singing, but they're just waiting on something. We've had lots, lots of nativity scenes that I won't go into. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, have we ever. And then I leave you with just a couple of quotes here that um, music is not the end. Music is a means to the end. And it's why we hate ACDA conferences so much is because music is the end. That's all they care about is making a perfect 25 minute set where you know they sing something, um, a lot of things, commission pieces with crunchy chords, and then their excitement is they end, used to end with Moses Hogan, but now it's Rollo Dilworth, and they feel like they've you know done their DEI work. Um, this is uh, attributed to sometimes to Maya, but sometimes to other people. This is the most true statement in the whole thing. Because when somebody says to you, um, oh my gosh, you remember that song that you sang at, at the holidays five years ago? And you go, I have no idea what we sang last year, much less. I was so moved by that song, that five years, I'll never forget it. It's really what I think we, we are supposed to live by. After Goodbye was <clears throat> amazing. 20 years later, um, the same Emmy Award winning documentarian came back and said, I want to update this. What, what's the chorus doing 20 years after the After Goodbye and did The Power of Harmony, which included gay adoption, gay marriage, just what has happened in 20 years. And it won Best Documentary at um, the USA Film Festival, which was fantastic. And then we had Everyone this assumes other that just because you were queer in the South that you were not okay. My grandparents are homophobic and I remember going to my first Pride Fest and I brought home a flag and they've just burned it on our backyard. It's not easy to just be yourself. This is just like the civil rights movement. A lot of our rights are being violated. In 33 states, you can still be fired or kicked out of your home for being gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. chorus in San Francisco. We're going around to cities all around the South promoting unity and peace. I would have never thought to go back home. I was 35 years old, beautiful wife and children when I came out. And no, you don't need to clap. It was shit. The church said you're going to say goodbye to your kids and you're not going to come back. There's no way I can hide in the South looking the way that I do. When I started to date this trans guy, my parents took me out of high school and kicked me out of the house. So you gotta bring your fight to the South. Quit acting like everybody don't want to accept you because that is never gonna happen. Evil Sodom and Gomorrahites live in these wicked cities in America. It's called what's right and what's wrong, bunch of perverts. It's really, really frightening. It's frightening for me. Because of our very, very strong religious background here in the South, people still have the Bible thrown at them. God clearly says homosexuality is an abomination. He didn't create people like this. Every person that we do meet has an interaction that changes them. An 83-year-old woman in this church this morning, she came up to me after worship and she said, I get it. I am not. And it was largely because you all were here. Then I ran. People who are out in places where it's not easy to be out is the coolest damn thing. To go to a concert for people like us, it seriously means the world to me. I am not. You always find people, even in the most unlikely of places, that want to wrap you in the warmth of friendship and understanding and acceptance. You have allowed me to come home, and we want to thank you for that. Music heals. It's healing me. You know, MTV bought it, and now it's on Paramount+. Plus. You can see it on streaming services if you haven't seen it. It's, um, yeah, I mean, we just decided to go on tour, and we had no idea that we'd make a film. We were going to like, okay, everybody get their iPhones, film, we'll get it, we'll take it all up when we get back and edit some film. And we were really lucky that the tour was life-changing. Again, life-changing for us, as is that. Um, AD tip number t 10 is build a team. 
build a team. Don't do this on your own. I don't believe you, Sean. I believe in a music input committee, and we have one of 25 people. The first thing I do is say next year, the themes are to the whole chorus. Send us your ideas. That way, after the fact, they can't say, well, I knew this song, but you didn't ask. Oh, yes, I did, and you didn't send it in. 25 people get all the potential repertoire for a concert. They listen to it. If we're not in pandemic, we, we kept going. They listen to it at home, and they all vote one to five. They rank them. That's that's the music input that I get. And then we sit down, Mitch and I and our team, and we go, okay, which ones of these do we really want to do? And we probably do the fives, like all the fives. And then we go down and we do maybe some fours and pick a three or so. And then every once in a while, there's a one. And I'm like, oh, no, we're doing that. I don't care what they said. Uh, they don't know the cumulative score. So for all they know, they're the only one that ranked at one. They didn't know that everybody ranked at one. And I'm like, that's fine. Uh, so build a team. Chris Verdugo has been fantastic. We have, we're in the middle of a, a two-year now long DEI initiative with a huge team of people helping us change the organization from top to bottom, including changing our bylaws this last June. And yes, um, I got to say, we bought a building. Do you like it? <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Oh, there it is. Um, it's just spectacular. It's really old 1928 vintage. It needs a lot of work. It's a fixer upper. Um, but we've, we've managed to get new ventilation for the rehearsal hall, which is really amazing. It didn't happen. It happened because I shared the dream with my singers. What would it be like if we had a building and it would cost $10 million and a founding member gave us $5 million? What? And at that point, the board had to say yes. I mean, yeah, we'll buy the building. I mean, how can you turn down $5 million? It's also okay to say no along the way. You can say no to singers. You can say no to people who want your group to sing, but you don't have the right mix of people to go out and sing. It's okay to say no to unhappy singers. Wait, let me do that one again. It's okay to say no to unhappy singers. About our second year, we were like full up and I'm sitting here and here's the membership and there are about 60 potential aud auditionees upstairs. And I said to the chorus, if you're unhappy, if you're not happy, in this chorus, doing this thing. Somebody there wants your chair. So if you're not happy, feel free to just move on. Well, like, a, you know, six, seven people, you can't say that. And I was like, bingo, the unhappy one, bye. It's okay to say no. It's also okay to say no to patrons who bring you uh, new music that they want to hear. It's been a crazy 70 years. And so, as you all know, I wrote a memoir Tale of Two Tims, Big Old Baptist, Big Old Gay, because I spent 35 years in a, as a Baptist and 35 as a gay. Um, so about, I don't know, three summers ago, we got a call and said, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir is coming to town, and we have this thing where we invite choirs um, to send some singers along and sit in on rehearsal. We'd like to, for you to send some of your singers. I'm like, okay. I'm getting punked right here, right now. You're lying. And they said, no, we, we can take as many as 30. And I was like, okay, but you're going to introduce us as the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. And we're going to wear the loudest t-shirts we have with the biggest rainbow on it. And they're like, okay. And so we did. And interestingly enough, I learned a new term because like, I don't know, 20 of those people used to be Mormons that we selected. We were like, if you're a FOMO, that's a former Mormon. Mormon. FOMO, uh, you get first dibs at going. That was all great until there was a, it was going to be a Monday night till I got a phone call on Saturday. We were in the middle of concerts and it said, hey, Tim, uh, we're so glad you're bringing some of your members on Monday to the rehearsal. Um, would you like to conduct the, the uh, orchestra and choir? And I was like, you mean in rehearsal? And he goes, no, in the concert. I literally stood with the phone doing this. <laughs> Dan thought I'd had a stroke and um, was calling 911 on his phone, and uh, it was actually true. Tonight, I am pleased to introduce to you our guest conductor for this evening. He's a singer, an educator, and a conductor. 
He actually knows what he's doing tonight. He is the artistic director of the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary. Dr. Tim Seeley. This is crazy. Um, of course, they didn't expect me to say anything. We're, not, we're just rehearsing. And of course, I'm going to say something. And so I took the microphone and I said, it's been a rough go with the Mormons and the LGBTQ community. Hearts have been broken and people have died. And I'm so glad to be able to be here and make music. And the chorus, the choir, were bawling to know that they'd been a part of that. And then I called them out and they were so loving. Uh, the, the Salt Lake paper the next morning said, Mormon Tabernacle Choir has gay conductor one night only, just to make sure. <laughs> the, um, the Mormon TV station interviewed me and they came up and said, so is a, a you know a white woman blonde. So is this just the highlight of your career? Yeah. And I looked at her and went, no, <laughs> it didn't make TV. It wasn't live TV. So it's like, oh yeah, that'd be no. Uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you all so much. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the losses that we've all had. And I've talked about the losses from AIDS, but that wasn't all. Um, talked about the woman who died in the women's chorus. I think you all know that some years ago we had a, a singer, a staff member who died on stage at intermission. And it was my job because they wouldn't move him. They were doing uh, at CPR behind the stage with the curtains closed. And I had to go out and talk to the audience for 40 minutes because Chris kept coming out and whispering in my ear, keep going, keep going. And it was hard. I mean, you, you, I know y'all are like, oh, that's easy for you. No, it's not easy when you know that someone is in distress. And he, he ended up dying. And then Chris came out and said, you need to let them go. And so I asked the audience to leave quietly. And um, it was one of the, one of the worst things. Um, I, in the time with San Francisco, I lost my mother, my father, my only brother. And then you all are aware that I lost my beloved daughter. And uh, it was our 40th anniversary and she died on Thursday. Um, I was there when she died. And the next Friday was our 40th anniversary. And the program was When We No Longer Touch. And I conducted When We No Longer Touch nine days after that. Um, I'm not over it. Uh, Mitch has been a godsend because when I'm on the podium and we have to sing something really poignant, you know, it just floods back. And I sit down and he stands up and just keeps going. It's pretty remarkable. Life is full circle, people, if you didn't know it. Um, remember the lullaby? Um, you know, I'm, I'm retiring. I'm 71 years old. I get to. When people go, why are you retiring? Because I get to. Um, but my mom was bedridden for eight years and you go to a senior citizen home and um, they can't remember their names and they can't remember their loved ones. They can't remember how to tie their shoe. But you walk in and you start, you are my sunshine. They remember every word to you are my sunshine. Music really does hit the mark. Withered hands, tired hands, reaching, holding, letting go, tired feet, worn out feet. Say why we reach 
we hold, we don't let go. We feed, we change, we hold you in our arms. And finally, we sing. the soothing serenade so we take your hands and we hold them in our own and we remember People ask, what are you going to do in your, in your retirement? Well, I started uh, a small business during the pandemic and um, of exercise videos. And I thought I would, I thought I would show them show one for you. Exercise day. Warm it up now. Three, two, one. Let's eat cereal, cereal. Let's eat cereal, cereal. Let's have Miller Lite, Miller Lite. Let's have Miller Lite, Miller Lite. Let's do Chardonnay, Chardonnay. For the big thing, Chardonnay, Chardonnay. Oh, jeez. <laughs> You think you think it's gonna go somewhere? <laughs> I think so. So your final tip: have fun. One of my favorite scenes, of course, is Steel Magnolias when they're just bawling and all of a sudden they're laughing. It's the best of all. I do have some things to do in retirement quickly. I have Clara Sky, Coriana's daughter, who I'm now her, you know, her bop bop, and um, she's now 11. And I also have um, Eden May, Clara Sky, and Cora Hope, who is named after Coriana. So I have four grand girls, and then I have um, Bobby Joe, and I will be moving to Portland. Um, the day after the July 13th concert. So if you, if you haven't already planned to come to the July concert, it's insane. It's being presented by the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra and they're playing and the Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir is joining us and I promise it won't last three and a half hours. <laughs> I leave you with my favorite poem. On the PBS documentary After Goodbye, one of my best friends, Randy Ray, had died and they filmed the memorial. And Randy used to send cards, and he put an anonymous poem in the card. And I read it at the memorial service, and then it was on PBS for 20 million people that night. And the next morning, I got a call from a man that says, Hi, my name is Patrick Overton. And I was like, Hello, Patrick, you know, thinking he was going to say it was so fabulous. And he goes, I wrote that poem. And I was like, Oh, shit. Because I thought, Oh, dear lawyers. And he said, he's a, a Presbyterian minister, and he said, when I heard my poem being read, I fell on my knees and thanked God that my words were being used. This is what I leave you with. When you come to the edge of all the light you have and step into the unknown, faith is knowing one of two things will happen. You'll step onto solid ground or be taught to fly. So I'm on my high dive. I'm on my retirement high dive. And I'm holding to that, that regardless what happens on July 14th, I'll be taught to fly. Thank you all. <laughs>